All right. Hello. Happy December Faculty Pub, pub Night to everyone. Uh, my name is John Jackson. I'm the Head of Outreach and Communications here at the William H. Hannon Library. And on behalf of Dean Christine Brancolini, I want to welcome you to the last Faculty Pub Night of 2018. Um, so this is now our fourth Faculty Pub Night of the semester. And uh, we are honored and thrilled to have one of our Loyola Law School faculty here with us, Dr. Robert Brain. Um, before we get started, and I hand it off to the person who will be introducing our speaker this evening, uh, just a little bit of administrative trivia. So you'll notice that um, you have feedback forms on your chairs. Um, before you leave this evening, yes, uh, Dean Brancolini is modeling them for us. Uh, before we leave this evening, if you could fill those out and then drop them into that uh, feedback box, the clear box over there, let us know um, what you enjoyed about tonight's event, and uh, that will help us um, inform that will inform what we do in the future um, also uh, if for the students who are in the audience if any of you need credit for attending tonight's event I can swipe you in through LMU Leo if you don't know what LMU Leo is don't worry about it I can just take your name down and you can tell me what your faculty member or your professor's name is and we can send them that information so let me know afterwards if you need to get credit for attending tonight's event uh, finally, um, Faculty Pub Night, in case you're not aware, is supposed to be a play on words, faculty publication, but also pub as in alcohol and cheese. Um, so it's, it's meant to be a very casual event where we get a chance to learn about one of our faculty members' uh, recent publications. Uh, so to that end, if you want to get up during the event and grab some more food or some more wine or beer or whatnot, please feel free. Um, in terms of Q&A, will you want to save the Q&A till the end? All right, there you have it. Um, all right, so without further ado, let me hand it over to Donna, who is going to introduce tonight's speaker. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Donna Brain. I'm a senior, or continuing senior here at LMU. I'm a philosophy major, and otherwise completely ignorant to video games. I'm not a good member of my generation. I, my f first Nintendo thing, and he's smiling because he, he's in on it, was like a Nintendo Wii. So, and that's not the uh, most hardcore of the Nintendos, if um, you're like me and didn't know that before. One thing that I really appreciate about my dad talking to me sometimes about his work is that programmers can sometimes fly under the rails in terms of sliding in data under the guise of something called like Easter eggs. And this was something that I didn't really know because I was like Nickelodeon all the way generation kind of a person. So I never really dove very deep into the deep dark net. But something called Easter eggs are things that are placed in video games. And the whole purpose is in terms of finding them, you have to sometimes do crazy things, not just like feats of skill, sometimes barbaric things, things where it totally crosses an ethics line but there has really never been a precedent for any video game law up until May Pops wrote um, one of these preeminent course books um, that have, it's already been implemented in most law schools. Um, do we have a list? Or I know certainly Loyola, but it's really kind of fascinating that that's never been, that's certainly, it's something that we need more of. And so with that in mind, I pass it off to your friend and mine, Bob Brain. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, you know, I'm lucky enough to speak all over the uh, world on uh, video game law, but never uh, do I get, um, you know, <laughs> I could get used to that, but I, uh, I probably should put it down or the presentation will be very different. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, I want you to all think about this, but Dean Gatton, I'm going to talk to you. Uh, uh, all right. You are 20 years old. Okay. You are a very good athlete. You were recruited by seven of the Pac-12 uh, schools to play quarterback, by Nebraska also. You um, are a three-sport, all-state California uh, uh, player in high school. And uh, you came from a small town uh, uh, in California. And you decided you were going to go to Arizona State. This is you. This is you in a, uh, elite, in a bringing Arizona State back in a game against Cal. Uh, you are at Sun Devil Stadium. And um, you, uh, 
<laughs> you were having a terrific junior year. In fact, you were mentioned uh, as potential Heisman candidate. And then you broke your leg. So football was out. So what do 20-year-old guys uh, do when the, they got time on their hands? They play video games. And when uh, Sam Keller here um, decided that he was going to uh, pull up Arizona State because he wanted to see how his team uh, would fare against Alabama, he saw this. <laughs> now, EA, this is a Electronic Arts uh, NCA football. Now, EA puts out a little brochure along with, uh, along with uh, um, uh, the game. And it uh, does not have the name of the quarterback. It's got number nine. But number nine was listed as someone who was a three-sport star in high school, as uh, somebody who was highly recruited, who came from a small town in California. And if you look, every member of his team, down to the second-string guard, was represented exactly like they really were, their heights, their weights, uh, all of that. So if we want to look at it and compare them, all right, uh, here is, in fact, um, uh, in the video game, Keller is playing Cal. Um, so what do you think, uh, uh, Sam? Are you, are you pleased by this? Are you, are you excited that you were, uh, uh, you know, your representation was in a video game, or do you have some other reaction? You're thinking somebody owes you money. The, that's right, the old American way, sue the bastard, right? Okay, I'm, I'm with you. That's about how I make my living, right? Um, so, uh, and there, you'd sue them because? Right, all right. So in, in uh, uh, the legal term we use, there are nils, so name, image, and likeness. Um, and it arises out of a right of, uh, of publicity, that, which itself arose out of a right of privacy. So if you have a right to be alone, to be private, to be let alone, when you choose not to do that, when you choose to expose yourself uh, to a commercial activity, you have a right to be paid. And um, uh, that, uh, then again, what, what can they take from you? They can take your name, your image, or your likeness. Now, um, not only uh, you know, did EA try and play a little funny by not putting people's names on the back of their jerseys and stuff, but EA knew that you could buy and download for free a software add-on and everybody's name appeared at the, uh, uh, at the back of their jersey. So um, um, that was uh, the beginning of, uh, of one of the major lawsuits involving video games in the last 10 years, all right? But let me give you a couple other things uh, to think about, all right? First is, do you think that video games are protected by the First Amendment, right? Speech is, books are, movies are. Should video games be protected by the First Amendment? Now, there's a history here that when video games were first started, when it was Pong, when it was uh, uh, Space Invaders, when it was uh, Pac-Man, um, the courts universally said no, uh, there's no First Amendment protection. It's just purely entertainment. But as games got more sophisticated, uh, we had a case go to the U.S. Supreme Court and they said that. Like the protected books, plays, and movies that preceded them, video games communicate ideas, even social messages, though many familiar, through many familiar literary devices. Characters, dialogue, plot, music, um, and through features that are distinctive to the medium, such as a player's interaction with the virtual world. That suffices to confer First Amendment protection. Right? So you get things like League of Legends and Fortnite and these you know, very complicated uh, games, and they now are protected by the First Amendment. Well, so what does that mean? Okay, I'm going to give you the two cent uh, uh, con law uh, 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 explanation. But when video games first started, like when there was Pongs and stuff, um, 
um, they were tried to be regulated by, by, uh, by the cities and by states. And you had regulations like the video parlor has to close, uh, the video arcade has to close at 10 o'clock, or uh, <coughs> you can't have more than four video games in a bar or something. And without First Amendment protection, when it goes to the courts, the courts ask, is it arbitrary? Is it, is it, you know, is there no reason for it? Because if there, the, the technical term is rational basis, but if there's a rational basis for the law, then it's gonna be upheld. And if the police chief said, well, you know, desire, undesirables hang around video parlors after 10 o'clock, the court said, fine, that's done. It's a big, you know, it's uh, uh, the, the, the law is fine. But once you get First Amendment protection, the state can't regulate it quite so much because it's a, it's a protected right. And you see this in what follows, but I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, and so the Supreme Court said, under our constitution, aesthetic and moral judgments about art and literature are for the individual to make not for the government to decree, even with the mandate or approval of a majority. So one of the things that the First Amendment does is it protects anti-majoritarian uh, 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 rights. And you should be free to speak. You should be free to make a movie. You should be free to have a, mo a, a, a television broadcast that is not regulated, the content of which is not regulated by the government. And so now the issue is, well, you've got this First Amendment protection of, of, of a video game, and <coughs> uh, so you have, a, you know, you have a, a, a very big right on one hand to be free of government regulation, and then on the other hand, you have a right of publicity, a right to your own nil, but which controls? Is it, the, is it the First Amendment right, which says the government can't force you to pay or the government can't force you to dictate the content of your video game? Or is it the right of, uh, the right of publicity that uh, you have, you, is stronger than the First Amendment? Now, when you first look at those two pictures of the guy, you say, well, geez, I mean, you know, you can't just, <laughs> you can't just take this guy's uh, uh, image, but let me give you so, a few other things to think about, all right? The Cal game, I mean, all of Arizona State football, but the Cal game in particular was, uh, was uh, uh, reported on by the Arizona Republic. This is part of what they said. Sam Keller did it again with his long hair blowing in the breeze before a packed Sun Devil Stadium, the California Red quarterback cocked his right arm and sent the ball flying towards his favorite receiver. Right. Now, is that appropriating Sam Keller's nil? Well, in words, maybe, makes you start to thinking about, you can visualize it, and, and uh, so maybe, all right? But even more, that picture I showed you before, that was from the Arizona Republic. Now, Sam Keller doesn't get a dime from uh, the Arizona Republic, and yet they are using his Im name, image, uh, to make money. And the reason he doesn't get a dime is because we have First Amendment protection for the press. And so the... Uh, um, the uh, one a question, and a question I'm going to be repeating is, is if video games have First Amendment protection and newspapers have video, uh, First Amendment protection, do we really say that, that you know, uh, 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 that uh, electronic arts has got to pay them in the same way that, that the Arizona Republic does not? So, okay, might say, all right, yeah, but... You know, the, the Arizona Republic is news, right? I mean, and there is, the Supreme Court has fashioned this idea that news, when it's newsworthy, it, 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 uh, uh, the First Amendment protections outweigh the uh, interest in state regulation of, of making you pay. And so, okay, the, this is, I mean, you can imagine that if, if you had to pay for this, the LA Times would be much different. You, you know, you could put a picture of, uh, of uh, you know 
Taylor Swift on, on, on your image section, you don't have to pay her for it, right? And if you did, you, everything would be upset, and so it's our tradition and our First Amendment that protects that. Now, let me do something that the, the, the legal uh, in law school would call contrafactual. So this didn't happen, but it could. Suppose there was the unauthorized biography of Sam Keller. He became some kind of a, a you know, a, a social uh, a hero, a, a Kardashian-like person, right? Now, it could say in there, it was a small town in California with this strong-armed quarterback, so cool in the pocket before a packed Sun Devil Stadium, learned how to cock his right arm and fling a football in a tight spiral. You, in the middle where they have those pictures, they could even have a picture. And Sam Keller gets nothing, right? Because it's an unauthorized biography. If you're gonna pay somebody and it becomes an authorized one, that's fine. But we have a bunch of unauthorized biographies and over the years, the, the subject of them have sued the, uh, the authors and sued, sued the publishers and they lose because again, First Amendment trumps the right of publicity. All right, now, <coughs> I have a video, YouTube video implanted and we couldn't get the technology to work, so uh, I'll, I'll at least describe it. But what happened uh, with the cow game, there was a, a broadcaster uh, in, uh, in Phoenix uh, on ABC7. And what I was gonna show you in the YouTube video is there was a video of Sam Keller throwing the football. And he said, it's a darn good thing. I guess you has Sam Keller at quarterback. The junior from California is putting up Heisman-worthy numbers for the Sun Devils this year. All right. So does Sam Keller get a dime from ABC uh, 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 broadcasting his, uh, his play? No. Same way that, that you know, Jared Goff doesn't get a dime when Channel 4 you know, shows clips of the, uh, uh, of the Rams game. So, either we have to say that video games are the same as books and that he doesn't get any money, or we have to find a difference between video games and books. All right, so what might be that difference? Okay, anybody have an idea? Yeah. All right, well, we're gonna keep that one on the shelf, but that is a definite difference. One is entertainment, one's newsworthy, all right? Um, the other thing is that um, video games are interactive. You change the plot, right? You are first person, you know, there is a difference between, um, you know, uh, uh, see it, reading a book, uh, vivid though it might be, there's a difference between reading a book and having the sheriff say, oh, you low, uh, low snake varmint, I'm going to shoot you. And a movie even where the sheriff comes out and says, oh, you low snake varmint, I'm going to shoot you, and you watch him die. And a game in which you actually do the shooting. Right? There's that varmint. All right. So there, you know, the, the interactivity is something that the video game manufacturers lean on heavily to say it's different, uh, or excuse me, the plaintiff's lawyers lean on heavily to say video games are different uh, than, than other First Amendment protected activities uh, and this entertainment idea. But the question is, is that enough? Well, we had another case that came up uh, dealing with uh, the House of the Dead and Mortal Kombat 3. And uh, there, uh, Indiana tried to regulate how they could be sold and who they could be sold to, and you have to be over 18. But it's the same idea. It's government regulation to a First Amendment protected activity. And the plaintiff's lawyers made the argument they always make that, there, that interactivity uh, is what makes it different and makes it more real and therefore should be subject to, to regulation. But the court says, well, Maybe video games are different. They are, after all, interactive. But the point is superficial and, in fact, erroneous. All literature, broadly defined to include movies, TV, and other photographic media, and, and popular as well as highbrow literature, is interactive. In fact, the better it is, the more uh, uh, interactive.
interactive. Literature, when it's successful, draws the reader into the story, makes him identify with the characters, invites him to judge them, quarrel with them, and to experience their joys and suffering as the reader's own. Uh, protests from readers cause Dickens to revise Great Expectation to give a happy ending, and tourists visit sites in Dublin and its environs in which the fictitious events of Ulysses are imagined to have occurred. So, you know, this court is saying uh, that, look, even if you have just the words, right, we don't care that even that you had the picture of, of Sam Keller in the newspaper. Just the words, you know, are tend to uh, themselves uh, uh, draw you in, make it interactive in your mind. And so the fact that uh, you can physically change the game as opposed to mentally uh, imagine the game shouldn't make any difference. All right, so let me give you something else to think about. This is a picture of Campbell's tomato soup. You probably didn't mean, need me to tell you that, but that's, uh, that's what it is. This is Andy Warhol's picture of Campbell's tomato soup. Andy Warhol didn't pay a dime to Campbell. Campbell's sued. Now they sued for copyright and trade dress and trademark and, you know, but that's the equivalent of things, uh, the, the nil equivalent of things. They say, you can't just take what we have, what we protected, what we paid, you can't take our nil, if you will, and just, you know, use it. You, you have to get our permission, you have to pay us for it. Court said no. Uh, because the picture uh, transforms the can. That there's a, tran you know, that, that he, uh, when it's a can of soup, it's a can of soup, but when it's a portrait, it makes you, it's a metaphor. It makes you reflect on society. You've changed, the, the medium has changed the message. So, if Campbell's, uh, excuse me, if Andy Warhol doesn't have to pay Campbell's, should EA have to pay Keller? Does the medium transform the message? Is it now the First Amendment rights to be able to make a video game without government interference? Do they trump uh, Keller's nil? All right, now, you might have an objection to this. All right, anybody have, anybody? Yes. Right, I, 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 I got you there, but I know I got you, but people who buy Andy Warhol paintings are paying for the taking the entire can, right? Um, and, and now you could say, well, you know, a can is a thing, right? And, and maybe there's different rules. You told me it wasn't rights of publicity, you said it was copyright and trade dress and everything. So let, let's see, let me give you something else to think about. This is Tiger Woods in 2002 when he, uh, if you're a golfer, you know that was the year he just, he killed the Masters. Right? He won by 12 strokes. Or something. And so there were a lot of these pictures. This was Tiger at his heyday, lots of pictures. All right. So an artist said, I'm going to take all these pictures and make a painting of Tiger Woods. And there's Tiger contemplating a putt and Tiger, you know, anguish and missing a putt and pretty much the same follow through in his, you know, red and uh, black uh, outfits and that sort of stuff. And he's standing in front of the Augusta uh, National um, uh, Clubhouse. So Tiger was not happy. Tiger's people sued uh, for a, a nil. Uh, uh, about his right of privacy. Uh, Tiger didn't want to be paid. He just didn't want it out there. And this guy was charging uh, 2000 bucks a print. Right? And the uh, court said, uh, uh, well, you know, the court said, uh, 
Tiger isn't, uh, isn't, uh, uh, isn't entitled to a dime. So, and I'll show you some of what the court said, right? Speech is protected even though it's carried in a form that's sold for profit. I mean, most speeches, right? The newspapers don't uh, publish for free. Uh, they publish to get ad revenue, to get the readership, the, the, the news clip. Uh, you know, they want readers, right? Uh, you, so you publish a book so you can make money. So that can't be it, right? It can't be that you're making money. The use of a person's identity, primarily for the purpose of communicating information or expressing ideas, is not generally actionable as a violation of the person's right of publicity. And then the examples are the ones we've talked about. Protected use of a celebrity's identity, likeness, or image, including unauthorized print or broadcast uh, biographies, novels, plays, or motion pictures. So the court said, and I'll, I'll pick up here after the ellipsis, but the court said, so Tiger, you're not entitled to anything. Right? You can take this, this has been transformed uh, in the same way the Campbell soup can was transformed. And so now it's, it's different. You're, you know, people look at it and see that you're contemplating things, that you're in different poses, in different, uh, you know, have the, the Augusta National Clubhouse uh, makes it transform. So again, the question is, if Tiger's not entitled to a dime here, should Keller be entitled to a dime there? Now, when can you recover, which everybody agrees, when, are the, when do the rights of publicity outweigh the, right, the First Amendment rights? All right, here. Such uses are not protected, however, if the name or likeness is used solely to attract attention to a work that's not related to the identified person. All right. That is very complex prose. And um, what it means is that uh, if you had Tiger, holding up a can of Campbell's soup, right? It's unrelated to his persona, unrelated to his, to his uh, job. And he says, you know, I, I, drink, I have a bowl of soup before I go out on the round, and it's mm, good, you know. Then, then, you, then the rights of publicity outweigh the First Amendment rights of commercial speech. But <laughs> when it's merely taking the normal activity that you do and transforming it onto onto a, a picture, then the rights, uh, uh, the First Amendment rights uh, to allow artists to draw what they want, control. And so here, do have we transformed enough of a picture into a bunch of pixels that can be rendered into uh, a, a, a player? Uh, um, uh, have we done enough to transform it? Is it uh, the kinds of things that, like a book and like a movie, that where the First Amendment uh, control? So we have Keller versus Electronic Arts, all right? And the court said there were two things that, that, made, it, um, that made it different, and the first was yours, all right? <sighs> Liability won't lie for the publication of matters in the public interest or for the use of name, voice, signature, photograph, likeness in connection with any news, public affairs, or sports broadcasting or account of political campaign, but EA isn't publishing or reporting factual data. This isn't newsworthy. EA's video game is a means by which users can play their own virtual football games, not as a means for obtaining information about real world football games. All right, so there is that distinction. It is entertainment, it is not information. Now. EA argued it is informational. Who, nobody knew who the third guard and, and you know, the left guard of Arizona State is and whether he was a good blocker and you know, if he played Alabama, would, would he be able to handle the Alabama guy and all of that. And so they said it does have some, uh, 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 give you some data. But court said no, um, that uh, you know, this, is a, uh, this is an entertainment game and that, that differentiates it from... Um, from a, a, a news broadcast or a book. The second is this transformational idea. We conclude that EA's use of Keller's likeness doesn't contain significant transformative events. Right? 
Users manipulate the characters uh, in the performance for the same activity for which they're known in real life, playing football. And the context in which that activity occurs is also similarly realistic, uh, realistic depictions of actual football stadiums. So unlike the Tiger photograph where you're taking what Tiger is known for, golf, but you're giving it a metaphor, you're giving it a, uh, a, you know, a different idea, here you're taking Keller's likeness and you're using it for exactly the same thing uh, that he's, he's known for, which is throwing the football. And so uh, in, uh, in the Keller versus Electronic Arts, Keller won. Keller uh, was, uh, um, uh, EA no longer makes um, uh, NCAA football because it says we can't pay all the players. Uh, there had been some talk about maybe the players can cede their, their nils to, the, to leagues and leagues can contract and give players money. But anyway, uh, EA says it's too complicated. We're out of the business. Now, would the same judge who wrote the Tiger Woods decision have written this decision? I don't know. Uh, would the judge who did the Andy Warhol have said it's not uh, transformative? I don't know. But that is an integral part of law, right, is that who's your judge? Sometimes it matters. And it matters, you know, you hear the talk and you've heard the criticism lately of an Obama judge versus a, you know, a, 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 you know, a Clinton judge or something. And, you know, I think I agree with the Chief Justice, you can't make broad sweeps, but people have different views. Uh, and that may have uh, uh, happened here. So what you, uh, what we've just done is what we do in law school, right? We take, we take ideas, we th look at things that look simple, we try and say, but have you thought about this? Have you thought about First Amendment? Have you thought about transformative? Have you thought about Andy Warhol and all that stuff? And so, and then, you know, we try and leave you with, uh, with uh, um, uh, you know, an answer when we can. I mean, that's, and we do it by generally by questions, and that's the Socratic method, which, you know, I don't even think Socrates used the Socratic method all the time, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, but it's also um, shows you kind of what video game lawyers go through, right? This is a, both of these are fairly slender reads, right? That, that uh, they were able to show that, uh, yeah, you can put us on TV, you can put us in a book, you can put us in a magazine, you can make a documentary about the Arizona State to, uh, a season, but that's different than just a game that does entertainment. And then again, the transformation is different than Tiger, is different than the can because uh, it's the same activity uh, 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 that's being used. So, in a lot of uh, in a lot of uh, uh, um, video game uh, litigation about regulation. It's those two things you're going to uh, that that we now look to uh, is uh, uh, the interactivity and uh, the transformation. Now, in our book, um, we uh, the first uh, I have a co-author. It's only in Laverne, so it really is our book. Uh, in the first edition, a lot of video game stuff was just uh, other stuff that happened to be in a video game. Uh, that there was no really sense of video game law. But in this, in this edition, uh, which is uh, published a couple years ago, and we're working on a third edition, there is video game law. These are the arguments that are being made, right? So, uh, you know, and, and there has to be, right? Video game industry is too big for there not to be legal issues. The, you know, if you, you, know, you throw everything in the pot, uh, this year, the video game industry um, expects that it will break, it will be an 11 figure industry. It will be over $100 billion. And, you know, there's got to be legal issues, right? There's normal legal issues about, uh, you know, uh, labor issues when you hire employees and packaging issues and, and all of that. There is intellectual property uh, issues, obviously, you've got. You know, different kinds of people who are involved. You've got actors, you've got musicians, you've got coders, you've got uh, uh, 
uh, you know, you got to get release of rights if you do things like Keller, right? Uh, um, and so, so you know, lawyers are all over uh, the video game industry, and there's becoming an emerging um, uh, body of law uh, that uh, deals with it. All right. What are some of the other, what I wanted to do tonight was not sort of just give you a list of a bunch of stuff that, you know, is involved in video game law, but kind of take you through a case. Um, and I'm going to take you through something else in a minute, but let me, uh, let me at least uh, tell you, you know, the, what, are the, what are the main issues in, uh, in uh, video game law? Well, there's, there's copying, right? It's too expensive. I mean, there's too much money. So that if somebody's got a good game, somebody's going to copy it. So this is Tetris, and this is a handheld game called Mino. Right? And uh, the uh, Mino, uh, uh, the Tetris people uh, sued uh, Mino for uh, copying their game. And the Mino people said, well, you know, uh, you don't have the rights to every puzzle game that there ever is. <laughs> if you have a puzzle game, you've got to have squares and, and stuff. And so, you know, you, uh, you have to let us, you have to let us, um, uh, uh, you know, have, a, have our rights to have our cup. You know, our bricks are a little different, our colors are a little different, it's a different game. Well, the court didn't buy it and said that, uh, <laughs> uh, said no, that was copying. Um, another issue uh, is trade dress and patent. Um, this is uh, something called Golden Tea Golf may have seen in you know, bars and stuff. This is PGA golf. The, uh, uh, there's a patented issue about this ball, uh, you know, that uh, uh, to direct it. And then there's a layout issue of the keyboard. Um, and, uh, you know, is that, uh, does that violate the patents? Does that violate the trade dress? There's a lot of litigation about that as well. Uh, and again, the court found uh, for the original, which was the golden tea, and so there was uh, too much copy. Okay, <coughs> now um, let me tell you about another issue um, that's come up that uh, you might not expect, all right? And that's gambling, all right? Maybe not in the way you think, however. All right, so the first issue, there are two big issues, legal issues right now in video game uh, development, right? One is this gambling thing. One is data privacy. Um, you know, maybe during the Q&A, if you're concerned, we can talk about data privacy a little bit more. Um, but I chose gambling because it's kind of interesting. So first thing is, what is gambling? Right? Uh, if we say you're gambling, what does that mean you do? Well, throughout the entire world, I mean, from, from you know, Far East to to Australia, to the, you know, Europe, to the United States. Um, the, the people who regulate gambling, who have to define gambling, say it's got three things. You gotta buy in, you gotta, you gotta put some money in the, uh, in, the, in the game. There has to be an element of chance, um, and then there's a prize, right? Now, the prize is where I want you to focus because that's where we're gonna have a have a uh, have an issue uh, in just a minute. You know, is there, is it? You know, what does it mean to have a prize? Is it, is it a payout? Is it money? Is it the value? What what is what is a prize? All right. So, how does that happen? It happens with loot boxes. All right. Now, if you are not a gamer, you have no idea what these are. Um, but if you are a gamer, you know that they uh, are uh, boxes that. Uh, appear uh, every so often uh, uh, in normal game play. And, you know, they're, uh, um, you know, you can buy them. There is a microtransaction. There are a couple of bucks, you know, maybe a dollar. Maybe you get a, you know, if you spend $40, you get 50. Some games allow you to um, earn them uh, through game play and levels and that sort of stuff, but hardly anybody does that if you're going to, uh, buy them. You, if you want them, you buy them. Uh, in the Harry Potter game, there's eight minutes of stoppage if you don't buy the loot box. So there's a real incentive to buy the loot box. And what's the gross revenue? Well, it's hard to tease out loot boxes from all microtransactions, but the thought is that it's about $12 billion a year to the industry. So out of this $100 billion industry, 12% of it 
um, are, are come from loot boxes. Now, when you buy it and you open it, they, they're very good about doing it with great fanfare. You can see a little bit. Um, so what is it that you get? All right. So this is not the best uh, uh, description or uh, depiction, but it's legal, and so I, you know, I grabbed it. Um, so most of the uh, things are crummy prizes, right? They, they're so-called skins, and skins to a video gamer means they change the skin of your bazooka from gunmetal gray to gold. Or something. They change the uh, skin of your avatar, and you can make it look like David Bowie or something. And so they don't affect gameplay. But every couple hundred, every couple thousand, uh, uh, become uh, prizes that, in fact, do have great amounts, uh, do have effect on uh, um, uh, gameplay. So they're a shield, or they're a, you know, a superpower of a bird, or a, a secret map, or something like that. So <clears throat> here's the argument. There's a buy-in, because you pay two bucks for it, or at least you, you buy in by, by your effort, by playing 16 hours and rising three levels. So there's, there's some kind of a buy-in. It's a chance about which kind of thing you get. And so the question has come down to, uh, do you get a prize? Is there a value? Now, the video game lawyers, known about this issue for many years, and they said, look, here's the deal, all right? These are just like, and there have been a bunch of uh, cases on this, these are just like trading cards. They're like Pokemon cards, right? That, and then the Pokemon, you know, the Pokemon challenge to gambling, they said, look, um, sometimes you pay money and you get a chance distribution, and sometimes you get a golden Pikachu card, and sometimes you get a Voldorb or something, and, and so it's the same thing. And the court said, yes, you have, value means monetary value. So if you've got you know, a, a Pokemon card and you run to uh, you know, Zimbabwe or something, it has no value. It's not currency. It's not backed by anything. So um, uh, they said the, same, the, the equivalent in a video game is we say you can't transfer uh, uh, or sell these things outside the game. That's part of the terms of use. So <coughs> I said, okay, that's, uh, you know, we've handled that, all right? But there's two things. One is everyone knows there's secondary markets for this. I, if I had the shield, I could go to eBay or a hundred other uh, websites and I could sell it uh, to somebody who wants the shield to play the game. So... You know, but the, again, the video game people say, well, I can't happen, you know, it isn't my, on my watch. I mean, I don't, you know, you, that, if that happens, uh, uh, you know, it's not, we're, we don't authorize it. And if you're wondering, you know, how it happens, like we would meet up and, you know, you'd pay me, you know, $1,000 or something. And then we'd meet up in the game and you'd bonk me on the head and you'd take my shield. Now, even more... Uh, is this idea that value, what if we decoupled the adjective mon monetary uh, from value? Because these prizes have value to the player. So, one question is, why is this coming up now? Right? Because there have been loot boxes for you know, 10 years. Uh, it's been a growing part of the industry. It's because of kids. Um, every so often you'll hear an article about some kid who spends $30,000, uh, you know, in, on the credit card bill in a month um, buying loot boxes, right? Well, that the video game industry could handle and, and does handle. But the, biggest, the bigger thing is they've studied the psychology of loot boxes. And you sometimes hear it called intermediate variable reinforcement or variable ratio reinforcement. But it is exactly the same thing that uh, for in adults you, makes you play slot machines. Right? That there's, there's an intermediate 
the enforcement. Right? You get it every so often, but the prize is such that you want to sit there. And you know, maybe you play because you like the social aspect and you like the free drinks or whatever. But as an adult, probably the thing that is motivating you is this idea of intermediate variable or variable ratio reinforcement. Well, it's one thing in an adult with a fully formed you know, brain to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, make a choice that that's how you want to spend your dollars. But it is not uh, for kids whose brains are developing. And so there is a, there is a gambling you know, uh, itch that gets scratched uh, by loot boxes. And if we are developing gambling addiction in kids, we got to, you know, we, it's a serious issue and we got to stop it. Video game industry, you know, just like the cigarette industry, you know, poo poo studies, but in the video game industry is trying to do that, but they've lost that battle. So, what's going to happen? Well, the first case went before the UK Gaming Commission. And they said, no, nah, it's, like it's like Pokemon cards. It's like uh, trading cards. Uh, no problem. And the video uh, game uh, industry breathed a sigh of relief. But about a year ago, the Belgian Gaming Commission came out with a study that said, nope, we think it's gambling. And because uh, uh, value doesn't mean monetary value, it means something of worth and something of worth to somebody. And the somebodies are the players in the game. The Netherlands Gaming Commission came out a, f a few weeks later and said, we think it's gambling because not only do you have the value idea, but you can sell it on the secondary market. And so even if it had to be monetary value, you can realize that. The state of Washington brought suit against uh, a video game manufacturing saying that loot boxes uh, are gaming and they've taken that position. And while that case is still pending, the judge has indicated that um, uh, she uh, believes that, that it probably is. So what's the effect? Well, there's going to be increased regulation, if not an outright ban. It is illegal to play a game with a loot box in Belgium because uh, Belgium has banned gambling. Um, the first country to sort of take this seriously, although they didn't make a formal finding that there was, it was gambling, was China. And China said, all right, you got loot boxes. First thing you got to do is you got to post the odds of getting the prizes. Right? There's a one in 250 chance you'll get the, the rare uh, 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 power medallion or something. Now, that seems okay. It doesn't seem like it's that big a deal, but it really is. Um, as I told you, you know, one of the things that, that video game lawyers deal with all the time is data collection. And they think that uh, on an average day, the, the video game manufacturers collect five tetrabits of data from around the world. Now, most of it is aggregated, but there's, you can tease out individual patterns. And what was happening was that there are companies that say, if, you, if I watch you play for 20 minutes, I can tell whether you're a, you want shortcuts or whether you want to you know, gut it out. And if you're somebody who wants shortcuts, then your odds of getting the power medallion went from 1 in 200 to 1 in 500. Because if you spent $40 today, to open 50 loot boxes, you'll probably spend $40 tomorrow. And so China said, uh-uh, we, we've got to have at least the odds. Uh, to prevent the little kids from charging the credit cards, there had to be dual authentication. Uh, and then you had to get a license from the uh, Chinese government. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, uh, I, I don't think that they are, uh, to the second question. Uh, I don't think they're going to be legally protected. I think, uh, I think uh, uh, you know, there are going to be – gambling in the United States is one of the uniquely state-by-state uh, -state things. We, don't, we have a couple of federal statutes that deal with gambling, but, you, you know, that's why it's legal in Nevada, not legal in California, or only card games or something. So I think you're going to have different – states who are going to say, we, we think it's the prize means monetary value, but I think you're going to have other states who are going to say no, uh, who agree with Belgium and stuff. And I think then you're going to see this increased regulation. In fact, 
you know, later on this slide is, is, is an example of that. Um, and the first part of your question was? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, to the, the very rare ones, um, are, it's a big deal. And, and just to give you an example that when Electronic Arts was going to come out with its new Star Wars game, uh, uh, the avatar that would allow you to play Darth Vader was in the loot box. Um, at least that was a, the initial kind of idea. So I think, I think depending on the game manufacturer, it can be very much. So the, um, the industry, uh, self-regulatory, uh, said, well, you've got to at least stick an in-game transaction label uh, on it. Um, Hawaii is the first state to actually pass a statute. It says you've got to post uh, ads, you've got to post odds, and you, you're, only, you're supposed to be 21 to buy a game with a loot box. Minnesota and California had, had uh, some uh, statutes. They died in committee, but, I mean, I think... I think it's common to the extent that people uh, continue to be concerned uh, about it. So, as I told you, that um, um, you know the uh, the new Star Wars game, Battlefront, came out last year, was going to have uh, um, Darth Vader as a loot box. There was such an outcry from um, uh, the playing public that two days before it came out, the uh, EA withdrew it. And in their next big game, Battlefield V, that was released about eight months ago, uh, they put out a tweet. No loot boxes, no premium pass, all players have access to the same uh, uh, maps. Um, and, you know, that is one way of getting rid of the problem, right? You don't have loot boxes. Uh, have microtransactions, let you buy a gate. If you or let you buy a fence, if you uh, want to play a Farmville, or let you buy a super duper, you know, uh, power pill, uh, if you want to spend five hundred dollars or something, uh, and so it's just you're taking the chance out of it. You're taking the gambling out of it. So both of these games have microtransactions. You can buy stuff. It's just you don't gamble with it. But the problem is, you know, there's going to still be a revenue gap this $12 billion, because right now players uh, estimate that or, or expect a, ga a new game, Class A, you know, Fortnite, or, uh, well, that's a free game, a freemium game, but uh, League of Legends or something like that is about Star Wars or something. It's about 60 bucks, 60, 65 dollars. But the all-in cost is about $120. And so they, they fund that difference through loot boxes. And so we don't know, you know, are the price of games going to go up? We don't know. All right. I think I'm about at the end of my time. I'm happy to talk about uh, eSports stuff or anything else you want, but I appreciate you coming in on a cold uh, uh, night in December and hope uh, giving you a couple things to think about in video game world. Thanks. Do y'all have? Uh, you we're talking about just at the end here about state by state regulations. Do you think that the video game companies would prefer something national? I mean, who knows what it could be, but the consistency would be more right. important to them, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. And um, the uh, the you probably heard about the recent uh, gambling decision right, by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, that um, and it's a little bit complicated, but let me see if I can uh, uh, explain it. The um, there are certain powers under the Tenth Amendment that are reserved to the states, and the and the uh, you know the question in front of the Supreme Court has always been what are those things? One thing that has always been true has been liquor uh, license. That's why every state has its own liquor regulations, and the second has been gambling. Now. Could the, uh, and in this uh, uh, gambling case, what happened was the federal government told the state of New Jersey, you cannot allow sports games. And the Supreme, uh, the Supreme Court said, you, you, as the federal government, you cannot direct a state to do something or forbid a state not to do something. Now, you can regulate individuals. You can say it's, it's, a, it's a, a violation 
violation of a statute if you try and place a bet offshore as an individual, but you can't tell the state what to do and what not to do. So the question would be, how would a federal regulation act? How would you set it up? We know now from the gambling case that you can't say no state can allow, no state can prohibit loot boxes because that violates this Tenth Amendment argument. But if the statute were crafted to regulate individuals and say, we declare that individuals can buy loot boxes, then I think you could. And yeah, that's one of the things that the video game developers are thinking about is that should we go national? But it's not clear that they would get the protection they want. It may be that federally they'll say, no, no loot boxes because we're protecting the kids. So it's kind of a tough call, but that's why you have lobbyists and stuff. But you're right, that would be another solution to this is to have, we don't have to worry about the state of Washington versus Kansas. We can have a uniform standard. I just don't know what it would be. And if I had to guess, my guess would be the people would come out of the woodwork saying we've got to protect the kids and then it would be gone for everybody. I think we were supposed to wait for the mic. Thank you very much. That was an incredibly interesting talk. Thank you. In terms of the state regulations versus the federal regulations, how is it practically possible to enforce the limitations of loot boxes in, say, one state versus another if I'm playing interactively on the Internet? Is that an issue? Yes. Okay. So it can be done. What happens, there are two ways to do it. One is that you can only log on to servers in your state. And that's, in fact, what happened. That is the model of Europe, as a matter of fact. And so there are people in Belgium playing games with loot boxes. And what they do is instead of logging into a .be, they log into a .fr. And so they're playing in France. And so you could, you know, but one way of regulating is to say, no, if you're in California, you can only log into, you know, a server located in California. And you'd have to have some way of making sure that's the case. But technologically, it could be done. The second way is, and they do this, you know, it is legal now in Las Vegas and in New Jersey and in Delaware to play casino games online. You can do roulette. You can do blackjack, you know, with real money and win real money. And they have site-specific software that says you can only play this game at a registered facility. And then you walk into the registered facility and it unlocks your computer or your phone and allows you to do it. Otherwise, you know, you're blocked. You know, we're back then to video arcades, right? You can only play loot box games, loot box, you know, games if you walk into a place that has the software that can unlock the phones. But it's probably better than nothing for the video game industry. So it can be, but it's expensive. And I don't know, you know, but you're talking about $12 billion, too, so it might be worth it. Yes, it was a great talk. Thank you. I was curious about going back to the Sam Keller case about if whether or not the photographer had any rights to the image from the newspaper. And then I was just wondering, because I remember the big Shepard Ferry Associated Press case with the Obama picture for his campaign 10 years ago. I'm just wondering if there are any nuances in that. There are. So in that case where they had the pictures of Obama and then he was shaded in blue and in red and all that stuff, 
they said that the First Amendment rights to, um, because of the transformative nature of those images, um, that there was no, uh, that President Obama had no right to, to you know, to, to object. But when you're talking about, yes, the, uh, uh, I'm at, a, I'm at a, 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 an Arizona State game and I take a picture of Keller, um, that's my intellectual property, and I, I, you know, I can sell that or, or decide not to. Somebody can't exploit that. So it was the newspaper, you know, who, who an employee to, who took the picture. Uh, it's an employee of the or somebody they have a license with that takes the video game or the video of the of the game. And so yes, there are intellectual property rights in the pictures. They just don't be they belong to the photographer, not the not the individual. And that's why Keller. Uh, didn't have, uh, that's what the argument was about Keller. But that's only because Keller is a public personality? I mean, you couldn't take a picture of the person sitting next to you in the stadium and, and exploit and, it? And uh, put it in the, uh, put it in, well, I think not now, but I could take a, you've seen the kiss cam, you've seen pictures of, uh, People in the stands, they don't, they don't uh, give their rights. They don't sign a waiver. They don't get paid. So um, it's, uh, 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 you know, could you, could you do it, you know, if we wanted to push it, could you stand outside somebody's house and have a long lens? Then you get into all the paparazzi cases, right? That, that, and, and at that point, when you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, the courts have said the First Amendment uh, interests aren't as strong. It's the same thing like, yelling fire in a crowded theater or something. First Amendment is not absolute. If there is a strong enough interest of something else, uh, uh, you know, the First Amendment will, will yield. But when you're talking about anything, it's not so much that he's public, but that, or he's, a, he's a famous, or that they're putting on this event, but it's the fact that you're out in public uh, that means you don't have a, a right to control your mill. So I'm wondering what did happen with sports games? I mean, did they have to all become fictionalized? With I mean, how did they deal with that? That's exactly what happens. Well, there's two things. There's college games and there's pro games. So with the pro games, they could negotiate with the players' union. And so all the players would assign their rights to the to the players' union, the players' union, and but then negotiate with the uh, with the uh, the developers, and then they get paid, you know, some some equal share or whatever they negotiated. On the college games, they're all gone. Uh, the, the, anything that's realistic is gone uh, because of Keller. Nobody wants to nobody wants to go through the litigation again. Nobody wants to pay. Um, as I said, there was a, some thought that maybe on the same model as, as the players' union in the professional leagues, that you could, um, um, uh, uh, you know, assign your rights to the, to the Pac-12, and then the Pac-12 could negotiate. But that hasn't taken very much traction. But another follow-up from that is, what if you used to be a member of the union, but you aren't anymore? And you remember, uh, you, you may remember this football player called Jim Brown. And so, EA also came out with a um, Legends of the Past kind of game. And so you could pick, uh, you know, Bart Starr as your quarterback and Jim Brown as your running back and, all, and, and then play against, a, you know, an equally constructed team by the other, uh, by, your, by your opponent. And <coughs> they are not members of the union, so they got nothing uh, for uh, their likenesses being appropriated in, in these games. And so um, uh, Jim Brown sued, and he lost. But he did. He alleged he, he alleged the wrong claim. Uh, the, the court said, "Look, you know, you may have a claim for right of publicity, but you're suing under, you know, it was the Lanham Act. But you're suing under this other act, and so uh, you know that doesn't give you any rights. So we're still waiting on the past players who are no longer a part of the union." They have baseball games like that. They have, you know, there's a bunch of them. And they, you know, I, I think there is a fair um, chance that the video game manufacturers uh, are going to have to pay those uh, ex-players. But as far as the current players, uh, there's a deal. And, and they now have it so that 
if you ever uh, uh, cede your rights, you, your rights are ceded in perpetuity, uh, but so is the payment. But it's these other guys who are, who are outside of that bubble who, who we don't know quite yet what's going to happen. Should, should Brown go back to Brown Jacobs? <sighs> he should. Um, I haven't heard. I mean, it's a fairly recent decision in the Ninth Circuit, so he might have, he, he's probably still within the time to appeal uh, to the U.S. Supreme Court. Maybe not. Maybe it's run, but uh, I haven't heard one way or the other, but he should, uh, I think. We got time for maybe one more question? If not, I've got one. Oh, you, you got one? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I am not a gamer actually. I uh, like my daughter. Uh, uh, I got involved in this. My my co-author um, has the only you know lawyers have to have man a mandatory continuing legal education. We have to do twenty four hours every uh, every three years, and he invented a video game that would satisfy that satisfied the California State Bar. Uh, and so it's called objection, and there's a judge, and <laughs> you sit there and you you object, and the judge goes overruled, and you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, and so uh, he's always been involved in video games, so he kind of put together the spine of the book, and uh, you know, not notes and not, but you know, a lot of the cases. And he went to the publisher, and the publisher said, you know. We don't like books by one author. They're too idiosyncratic. You need a, you need you know someone else so we know it's uh, it's really the law. And we've been friends for a while. And he asked me if I wanted to do it, and so I said yes. Well, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I. You know, when I when I talk about research assistants, you know, so, you know, I'm, I need some research assistants uh, this year, and I'm thinking about working on the video game book. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> might because they think we we got beta versions of you know uh, Galactica, but. Uh, it's not, you know, it's cases, but it's just cases about video games. So the, the third edition is coming out s sometime uh, in the no, next few gonna years? we're going to try and have it to the publisher this summer, and so it'll be out next year. And, and what, if you can tell us, what are some of the recent additions to the third edition that weren't yeah. included before? Uh, one is data privacy, uh, because the GDPR, which, you know, changed everything uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, data collection in the United States because of the same problem that you asked about, how could you enforce it state by state? How can you, if you're playing Fortnite or League of Legends, if you have to comply with the British uh, or with the, uh, the, the UK, uh, the EU privacy things, you're going to have to do that in the United States. And so that's a big issue. Um, and the other one is eSports. Um, eSports was not nearly the, uh, uh, the behemoth that it is now uh, when our last edition came out. And um, as we were talking beforehand, you know, how many schools do you think about scholarships for um, uh, esports now? Uh, and the answer is 120. Uh, and yeah, and uh, and the first one was in Robert Morris, and uh, I think it's in Indiana, right? Yeah, yeah. and uh, it uh, it gave a partial scholarship to two kids five years ago, and from that. We now have 120 um, uh, colleges that give out scholarships, and there are, are tournaments, and uh, uh, you know, the, there's a Fortnite tournament, League of Legends tournament, Overwatch tournaments, and um, you know, there's a lot of money involved in them. There's betting on them, and so esports has been the, is a, is a big uh, a new chapter. Yeah. Well, well um, the, no. It, no one really. Let me uh, let me show you a couple of things. All right. So, um, the uh, uh, one of the issues in esports is speaking, uh, and there is now a voluntary association of all esports presenters <laughs> who who uh, the people who put on the league conceded the authority to investigate the team through this voluntary organization. So there's nobody. Age won't be in 
sitting on sitting on a tree is some kind of cultural tradition or some cult or tradition. Money comes, you got problems. Yeah. Um, as a member, okay. Uh, as a member of some of the communities that you talked about, uh, like Star Wars, Dota, stuff like that, um, you know, I play those games, and when the loot boxes were implemented, I was really frustrated because, um, you know, people, I knew people who had more money than I did could. You know, just pay to to get different things in the game that I couldn't. Right, those that bastards I had to work. at USC, right? <laughs> <laughs> I had to work hours for certain things, yeah. and and they would just pay. Um, and um, I just want to ask you, how do you hear about those controversies? You know, do you do you follow game boards? Do you just look um, on CNN? Do people yeah, tell two, you? Two ways. Uh, uh, I mean, I do follow stuff, and I've you know I got a uh, electronic database that searches words for me and sends me stuff every. Uh, every day. But the other thing is, uh, I am a member of the Video Game Bar Association. There is such a thing. And uh, so we, uh, we raise, you know, the, there, there are two annual meetings, and so the big issues get talked about there. And um, there's a newly formed organization. I'm the first professor who's been elected to it called the Esports uh, Bar Association. So, um, you know, we got people, staff who are dedicated to putting together panels to talk about the, the big legal issues. Is there, a Loyola Bar there is. We, we, I am proud to say Loyola held the first one. It was held at Loyola Law School for eSports. And uh, the, um, the uh, uh, video game ones are usually a lot fancier. They're, you know, hotels. And they're, 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 it's really expensive. And uh, Loyola is not pleased that I, that, you know, I spend $1,200 to go to a one-day seminar. But, um, but it's, uh, on the other hand, it's where you pick up the new issues, so. So I'm going to resist the urge to ask you about your automatic search query database that you've got set up um, and just say uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing right, your experience you. with us and let's have a round of applause. So uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, just a reminder, if you've got feedback forms, drop them over here in the box. Um, students, if you need credit, come see me. And uh, we still got the room for another 12 minutes, so please eat the food. Thank you. Thank you.